I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we continue our investigation into the murders of the McDonald family. Welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my enchanting co-host, Alice. That's so nice. I love... Wait, was it a movie or a book? Enchanted. It was Enchanted? a movie and a book. I think it was a movie. Ella I don't Enchanted. Know. Ella Enchanted. Yes. Wasn't it like a modern take on an old fairy tale? Am I wrong about that? Yeah, it, it was, and it Which was fantastic. Which one was it? All of Sleeping them? Beauty? Cinderella? I think Cinderella. Cinderella. I think it yes. was Cinderella. I think it was Cinderella, and she wore a green dress. It was a fantastic book and then made into a movie. I think Anne Hathaway, Anne Hathaway. right? Yeah, yes. Anne, Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. There you go. And I think, uh, was Minnie Driver the stepmother? Oh, I cannot I remember. Because I think when I watched it, time. I was so young, I don't think I quite knew like who Minnie Driver was, you know? I mean, that That's movie's from the early 2000s. I'm surprised you were even alive back then. Okay, okay. That's incredibly flattering, but not true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how I wish. Whatever oh, especially because my favorite review of us calls us... It, it's a it's a five-star review, I believe. It's a very complimentary Oh, yeah, yeah. Review, we were happy with the but review, it, but it leads generally off, speaking. Yeah, it leads off with middle-aged co-hosts. <laughs> I yeah, still can't get over I it. Know. I don't know about that. It's... There was a lot of drinking this weekend thinking about that review, and it sort of put me in a dark place. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, thank you for the leaving compliments it, whoever, because of the whoever. middle-aged comment. Middle-aged, yeah. No offense to those of you who are middle-aged out I there. I mean, but... it's not it's not offensive. It's just it kind of pushes me, you know, further down the timeline than I am ready to be. I would like to think all of us who are middle-aged are young at heart. And we really, that's what we should be thought of as young I mean, some of us may be geriatric millennials, so. That's true. Alice is a geriatric millennial. Actually, no. I'm not. I'm the geriatric millennial. You're a geriatric millennial. You're like an exennial or whatever. What are you? Are you just a millennial? Am I like a a middle-aged millennial? You're a middle-aged millennial. I (laughs) consider myself Generation X, X forever. (laughs) You know, none of this millennial stuff, but... Apparently that's that's not how they they do it. What are you gonna do? We'll survive. We'll survive, Alice. Somehow we'll make it. Well, guys, we are back tonight to talk to you more about the Jeffrey McDonald case, a case that a lot of you guys had asked us to cover, and is a case you're very interested in, and I think is one of the most interesting cases in true crime. Last week we talked a lot about the case, the the day of the murder, the timeline, some of the legal wrangling around the trial. Today, we're really going to dive into some of the theories about this case, and we're going to talk about what really makes this case amazing, and that's the story that Jeffrey McDonald tells, which is so evocative and so it captures you. It's a story that that fits with the times and is so, I mean, it's almost like a novel. This group of hippies come into the house with a candle chanting, acid is groovy, kill the pigs it's so perfectly 1969 1970 that it makes you wonder whether it actually is a work of fiction but today we are going to dive into that story the evidence that supports what mcdonald said happened and some of the characters and they truly are characters who came about as this trial and its aftermath continued to capture the american imagination Absolutely. And last time we told you the story, but there's so much evidence in this case. And let's start talking about some of this because one of the gripping parts about this story at the time and even now is these hippies, these hippies who come in saying acid is groovy. So what 
evidence was there against the hippies? Well, what do we mean when we say the hippies? The first one that comes to mind, the woman in the floppy hat, Helena Stokely. Now, Stokely has long been the primary suspect in the McDonald case for those who think that the doctor is innocent. She was known to wear blonde wigs and floppy hats, and she generally matches the description of the woman that McDonald claimed to have seen the night of the murders. A woman matching this description was also seen alone along the road some distance from the home by one of the military policemen responding to the scene. Now, Stokely's testimony has changed over the years. At trial, she testified that she was not involved in the murders, but she also acknowledged that she was so heavily under the influence of drugs at the time she really couldn't say what she had or had not done that night. All she remembered was taking some mescaline around midnight. She testified that she had participated in witchcraft rituals with some of her friends, which involved a lighted candle and the killing of small animals, usually a cat, and the sprinkling of the animal's blood over a person or thing. That night, she had gotten home around 4.30 in the morning. Now, this is fascinating, absolutely fascinating, because if you remember from the Temujin Kensu episode, it was the prosecution putting this weird dark arts, Eastern arts environment around Temujin. But Temujin wasn't really this dark figure. Here, it's not a story being told by anyone. It is actually Stokely on the stand talking about not only the fact that she was heavily under uh, the influence of drugs, but also that she was engaged in some type of witchcraft event that included killing and blood. These are all, this is not good for her in terms of her innocence with respect to the McDonald murders. And a lighted candle. I mean, here's the thing, guys. If you listen to the first episode and you were like, well, I don't really know why this is such an interesting case. Well, imagine you had never heard of this case. Now I think you get it. I mean, we barely even in dug into this. And this, this Helena Stokely character, you have McDonald, who says he wakes up to see people surrounding him. And the person he describes with the most vivid detail Makes sense, right? Like, you basically have some generic men who are there doing evil. And then you have this woman in this floppy hat and this blonde hair. And you can imagine it, right? This candle in her hand lighting up her face, sort of the flickering candle in the darkness. And she says, acid is groovy. Kill the pigs. And it's so crazy, you think, no way that happened. Like Alice said, this is like the kind of thing people were coming up with in their darkest fantasies and, and worst fever dreams to convict people like Timogen Kinsu in the West Memphis Three. This witchcraft thing and women with candles and blood sacrifices. And then you have Helena Stokely shows up and she's like, yeah, I wear floppy hats. Yeah, I wear, I have blonde wigs. Uh, oh, and by the way, me and my friends like to get high and engage in satanic rituals that involve sacrifices. And occasionally I have a candle when I'm doing that. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Maybe McDonald's telling the truth. And it's just, it's incredibly, it's so crazy. And this is, I've told you guys before at the start of the last episode that I became obsessed with this case. And this is one of the reasons. Because you hear this and it's just like, man. Maybe McDonald's telling the truth. And if he is telling the truth, then this is right up there with the Manson murders in just insane, crazy, hard to believe story. Brett, before we move on, I am so excited to introduce our next sponsor, Green Chef. As you know, being a full-time prosecutor, full-time podcaster, full-time mom, and so many other things, getting a healthy meal on the table is a struggle every day. But enter Green Chef. I am so excited to have this box prepare meals ready at my door, ready for me to cook. Um, and my kids love it. Both of my sons gobble it up. My husband loves it. We never actually have any leftovers because it's so good. I recently made the pork tenderloin for my family and they kept demanding more. So I had to save my recipe for, for future pork tenderloin. And I got to tell you, Alice, the thing that I like about Green Chef is it fits your 
diet no matter what it is. Green Chef lets you choose from a wide array of easy to follow recipes perfect for keto, paleo, and plant powered diets, or even if you just want to eat in a more balanced way. You can make leading a healthier lifestyle easier than ever with satisfying home cooked dinners with options that work around your lifestyle, not the other way around. I like the keto options and I love having everything there ready to go. It's not like I'm giving up cooking. It's just that cooking is easier. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh, and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. I love switching between the brands, and now you all can enjoy both brands at a discount on us, and this is a great discount, y'all. Go to greenchef.com slash prosecutors100 and use code prosecutors100 to get $100 off, including free shipping. That's an incredible deal. Go to greenchef.com slash prosecutors100 and use code prosecutors100 to get $100 off, including free shipping. And figure out for yourself why Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. Absolutely. And, you know, her testimony, it's so, it's so interesting because she herself is not even necessarily denying. She she is saying she had nothing to do with the murders, but she also, in the way she's testifying, is essentially saying, but maybe, I really don't know because I was so um, under the influence of drugs, I don't know anything, essentially. So she, her, her own testimony kind of leaves open the possibility that she is involved and she herself just does not know. At various times, Stokely swore that she thought she had been involved in the killings, while at other times she swore she had nothing to do with them. So remember, she testified at trial that she had nothing to do with it. But then later on, sometimes she said, no, I, I really did have something to do with it. This is not that uncommon because Stokely was a heroin and opium addict at the time of these crimes, and she regularly used other drugs such as barbiturates, PCP, LSD. In fact, she used LSD almost daily, marijuana, mescaline. I mean, she was using many different substances that may affect her memory, that may affect her consciousness um, of what she has done because of her changing stories of being involved in the killings then saying she's not involved in the killings. Law enforcement tried to subject her to polygraph tests. Again, you know how we think polygraph tests are not very valuable instruments. Even though they tried, Stokely was usually so high on drugs that these polygraph tests were completely useless. And if in fact she was so high at the time of the killings, I'm not sure she would be lying if she said she didn't know. What happened at the murders? Helena Stokely is a tragic figure in this case, whatever you think about her. She was on a lot of different drugs, and she was not sort of a recreational user of these drugs. I think sometimes people, you know, somebody smokes marijuana every now and then, and people try to act like they're drugged out, crazy person that you can't believe. Helena was, she was using a lot of drugs. She was clearly self-medicating. In addition to this, it's pretty clear she had some pretty serious mental health issues as, as well that were never treated. She was a, a sad figure, and the drugs didn't help. And Helena, she was also very suggestible, obviously. And I think that's one of the reasons where she could not decide whether it was possible she was involved in this or not. Even just a few days after the murder when people asked her about it, she said something along the lines of, I don't know, I could have been there, I just don't know. And it's an interesting thing, because you had this MP who saw somebody wearing a floppy hat. We may talk about that more later, but this fits her description. And when you think about that fact, and you think about what McDonald said, it just really gets into your head and it makes you think there's a possibility here that something much more complicated than a simple, I hate to call it simple, but a simple mass murder occurred here. And it gets even more interesting because finally, 10 years after the murder, more than that, 12 years, 13 years after the murder, after McDonald has already been convicted, 
Stokely finally gives what can be characterized as her most coherent and complete statement of what happened that night. And I'm going to read to you how this statement has been summarized by the McDonald defense and by the courts. I forget exactly where this one came from. It either came from one of McDonald's 2255 motions, which is a collateral appeal motion you file in federal court when you're attempting to to attack your conviction or possibly in one of the district court opinions about McDonald. One thing you can do until your heart is content in this case is you can read legal filings. As we said yesterday or last week, this is the most litigated case in American history. There are tons of briefs, tons of opinions, an almost unlimited amount that you can read. So if you're interested in this case, I promise you, we're going to put some stuff up on the website, block off a week or so, because you're going to be diving down rabbit holes until you, you can't stand it anymore. But here is what this is, here is, here is what Stokely said. This is her most coherent story. So if you think Stokely was involved, this is probably what happened. Stokely was a member of a satanic cult, which was angry with military physicians, McDonald among them, because they refused to help drug users with their problems. The leader of the cult decided to approach McDonald and attempt to obtain drugs from him and persuade him to treat drug addicts. So already you're seeing this story is both strange and a little incoherent, right? So she's a member of a satanic cult, but it's also a satanic cult that's into drugs. And it's a satanic cult that wants McDonald to help drug addicts to treat them, but also to provide drugs to them, presumably the kind of drugs that they're addicted to. So weirdness already going on in this statement, but nevertheless, that's what she says. Stokely was assigned responsibility by the satanic cult leader for determining the whereabouts of Colette McDonald on the night of February 16, 1970, and made a pretext telephone call to the McDonald residence at about 6.30 p.m. that evening and learned that Colette would be attending school at a North Carolina State University Extension at Fort Bragg that evening. Now, this is something that I have not been able to run down, and if you were able to do it, please send me the information. There are several alleged phone calls that happened in this case. Today, if this, if you had this, you would look at the phone records, you'd be able to look where these calls came from, where they went. This is 1970. I'm not sure that you can do that at that time. I've tried to find some record to confirm or disprove this. I have not been able to do that. If you were able to do that, I would love to, to know that information. She, being Stokely, and several other members of the cult later went to the North Carolina State University Extension and spoke with Colette in an unsuccessful attempt to persuade her to talk to her husband about the cult's concerns. Interesting thing, this is the first time we've ever heard anyone allege that the cult members had spoken to Colette before the night of the murder. And in fact, Stokely also says that at some point she'd actually already broken into the apartment and stolen a piece of jewelry of Colette's. There's nothing really to back that up, but it's another part of this story. In any event, later that evening at approximately 10.30 p.m., Stokely, Greg Mitchell, who was her boyfriend, we're going to talk more about him later, Shelley Don Harris, Bruce Fowler, and, and Dwight Edwin Smith met at Stokely's apartment where they discussed their plans to go to McDonald's apartment to seek his cooperation. Stokely thereafter took some mescaline offered to her by Greg Mitchell, and the group went to two local restaurants where they stayed until the restaurants closed. The Stokely group left a Dunkin' Donuts restaurant at about 2 a.m. and drove to the McDonald residence. Bruce Fowler then parked the car nearby and the group walked along the sidewalk to the rear of McDonald's apartment and entered the home through a utility room door. It was dark inside the house and Stokely lit a candle to help the group find their way. They walked through the house and into the living room where they found McDonald asleep on the living room couch with a book across his chest and a Valentine's Day card on the couch next to him. Stokely noticed that the television was on, but there was no picture because there was no programming that late. 
Now, some members of the group shook McDonald to awaken him so that they could talk to him about drugs. But upon awakening, he became excited and began to fight with them. During the fight, Stokely chanted, Acid is groovy, kill the pigs. When the group finally subdued McDonald, they told him that they wanted drugs and he agreed to call a friend of his to see if they if he could get some. He went to a wall telephone in the kitchen, but instead of calling his friend, he attempted to call the military police. The group overheard the conversation and again assaulted McDonald, this time knocking him unconscious. One thing one thing that's interesting about this story, remember, we told you last time what McDonald said happened. He woke up, there were people surrounding him, one of them was chanting acid is groovy, kill the pigs. His wife, he looks into the bedroom, there are people attacking her, she's screaming, Jeff, why are they doing this to me? His kids are screaming, he's fighting them, he gets knocked out, he wakes up, there's Colette, she's been stabbed to death. He doesn't say any of this in his story, right? McDonald never says that he talked to the group, he never says that he made a telephone call for the group or that they wanted drugs. He doesn't talk about any of this. So this is something that Stokely is saying that is at odds with the story McDonald told us earlier. Absolutely. His own, this story does not jive with what he has told us so far. According to Stokely, things, quote, got out of control. At this point, she heard Colette McDonald calling to her husband for help from the master bedroom. Stokely went to the room where she saw Colette being assaulted by Greg Mitchell and another member of the group. She noted that one of the McDonald children was in the master bedroom with her mother, but appeared to be asleep. Stokely left the master bedroom and went into one of the children's bedrooms where she saw a record player, some books, and a hobby horse, which she noted was broken. She then heard the sound of running water in a bathroom and looked in to see Greg Mitchell washing his hands at the sink. Stokely then heard a telephone ring and another member of the group told her to answer it. She answered the phone and heard a soft voice ask for Dr. McDonald, whereupon she began to laugh until someone in the group ordered her to hang up the telephone. The group became scared and left in a hurry, leaving all of the murder weapons behind except for a pair of scissors. So a couple things about this. One of the things people who support McDonald point to is Stokely saying that in the bedroom she saw a record player, some books, and a, a hobby horse, a toy horse, like a rocking horse, that she noted was broken. Now the reason she said it was broken is she said she got on it and tried to ride it, and it wouldn't ride correctly. Apparently, the, ho the horse was broken. And some people have pointed to this and said, how could she have known that if she hadn't been there? And that's a great question, right? And that's the kind of thing you think about when you think about holdback evidence. It seems like great holdback evidence. If, if the police held back all this evidence, then you could compare it to what Stokely said, and you could, you could you know, eliminate her as a suspect. Unfortunately, in one of the newspaper articles that ran shortly after the murder, there was a photograph of the the room that she's talking about. And you can see in that photograph the record player, the books, and the 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 children's horse. Um, the horse apparently was broken. Some people actually dispute this. Some people say it wasn't broken. There was a report, a media report that was broken, though, and this is the problem. There was so much reporting on everything in that house that it's hard to say how Stokely learned this stuff. Did she learn it from her personal experience with the home or did she just read about it in the news? And we've talked about holdback we've talked about holdback evidence before. This is sort of a concrete example of why it's good. Stokely knew this information possibly because she had seen it in the media, not because she had experienced it firsthand. And that makes it almost impossible to determine whether or not her confession is legitimate. You also notice, as I talked about before, this is another telephone call, this time an incoming telephone call. It's a weird thing. This, if it happened, is happening at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. Why someone would be calling Jeffrey McDonald and asking for Dr. McDonald at that point in the morning, I can't say. Obviously, if you could track down that telephone call and confirm that it happened and confirm 
that a woman answered and laughed, that would be interesting, right? I mean, that would tell us a lot and might confirm the story, but as far as I know, that has never happened. So at this point, after leaving the McDonald, <clears throat> after leaving the McDonald's apartment, the group goes back to Dunkin' Donuts. We can't get away from Dunkin' Donuts. It comes up in like all our cases. It's crazy. Where Stokely went inside and washed her hands. She was eventually taken home at about 4.30 a.m. When asked by her roommate a few days after the murder why she had participated in the crimes, Stokely told her roommate that the McDonald's deserved to die. She disposed of her floppy hat, which she had been wearing during the murders, and gave her blood-stained clothes and boots away to a friend of hers, Kathy Perry. She told Perry to dispose of all these items. The members of the cult eventually moved away from Fayetteville, North Carolina, and lost contact with each other. As we talked about earlier, McDonald called her to testify, and she did testify in his trial, and she explained in this statement that she perjured herself in order to escape prosecution, but that she eventually decided to confess to the crimes to clear her conscience. It's interesting, she's giving this statement in the 1980s at the height of the satanic panic, so maybe it's not surprising that she includes the satanic angle in this story. Personally, it makes me question it that there is that, that angle the satanic panic, which sort of swept the country from the 1980s and the early 1990s, had a lot of different police departments, really from local agencies all the way up to the national government, believing that there was this sort of nationwide underground satanic organization, which was involved in all sorts of crimes, from murder to child abuse. Eventually, the FBI said that they had never been able to tie any crime to any kind of organized satanic activity. Not to say there weren't people who considered themselves Satanists who committed crimes, that certainly happened, but no sort of cult activity the way we're talking about here, where, as Helena Stokely said, she was ordered by the head of the cult to engage in this activity. But frankly, the biggest problem with this confession is probably not that satanic angle or some of the seeming impossibilities given the evidence, it's that, as we discussed earlier, it is completely and utterly incompatible with what McDonald has been saying for going on 40 years now. I guess we're close to 50 years now. He has never said that these individuals were in his home before. He has never reported that they broke in before or that anything was stolen. As I said earlier, there's a story that Helena broke in and stole a necklace. He's never said that. He's never said that he talked to people for nearly eight minutes before the attack, which is what Helena said, or that he made the call to the MPs in, a, in an effort to summon help before the attack began in earnest. Stokely also claimed that one of the people who was with her that night was an Alan Mazzaroli, but he was in jail at the time of the crimes, which is basically the best alibi that you can have for a crime. And in fact, other than her boyfriend, Greg Mitchell, and we're going to talk about him in a minute, the other individuals Stokely hung out with at the time, they all have alibis for the night that have been confirmed by multiple witnesses. Now, alibis can be faked. That's certainly a possibility, but it does weigh against the truthfulness of this extraordinary statement that Stokely's making. And I think with an extraordinary statement, you need extraordinary evidence. And frankly, there's not a lot of evidence to support what Stokely's saying, but there is evidence against her story and in the nine years leading up to her trial testimony in the few years before this statement stokely was diagnosed with hepatitis she had had a stroke and she had been diagnosed with a schizoid personality disorder alice before we continue i want to talk about one of our favorite sponsors of the podcast felix gray you know it's summer you're going to be outside you're going to be enjoying the the wonderful weather and there are no better glasses to wear than felix gray glasses i got my hamiltons and they look awesome but not only do they look awesome they are practical too felix gray learned a long time ago that our eyes are not meant to look at screens blue light is what's keeping you up at night it's what's giving you headaches and it's coming from your computers it's coming from your phones and felix gray glasses are designed to filter out that blue light 
Brett, I know exactly what you mean. Staring at a computer all day for work, for podcasting, just scrolling through my phone, I was getting these massive headaches. But then I got I got the Roebling Felix Gray blue light filter glasses, and I can really tell the difference, especially when I have to focus on the computer screen for an extended period of time. You can check them out now, felixgrayglasses.com slash TP, and see what we're talking about. Felix Gray offers classic frame styles made from acetate and hand-finished for a durable, lightweight, and really comfortable pair of glasses. And with their 30-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose but eye strain. So get yourself a pair of glasses made for the 21st century and designed for modern, hard-working eyes. You have no nothing to lose except maybe eye strain go to felixgrayglasses.com slash tp for the best blue light glasses on the market that's f-e-l-i-x-g-r-a-y glasses.com slash tp free shipping free returns free exchanges felixgrayglasses.com slash tp and this is really hard because i know a lot of people can't get over the fact that she confessed to the murders, right? That she had something to do with these murders, that she was there that night. But unfortunately, what we see is that when we have a lot of drug use, when we have um, personality disorders, mental illness involved, false confessions do happen. Uh, you know, we'll dive more into whether this is a false confession or not. But I know a lot of people are stuck on the fact that she confessed to this. So who would possibly confess to being involved in these horrendous murders if they had nothing to do with it? It happens. And sometimes people's minds are so really, for lack of a better word, messed up at that point, whether because of drug use or strokes or other sort of ailments that they may have, that they may even believe what they're saying. But that's why evidence is very important. Even when someone confesses to us in our line of work, that's not all we go on. We have other evidence that must back it up as well. Because if you were to indict someone based on just their, their supposed confession, they can retract it at any time. They can, you know, say, I was forced to say that before I changed my mind now. And, you know, things can go south. That's not all you go on. You need evidence. And that's why it's important to look at the totality of the evidence in this case and see if Stokely's own statements match with it. We talked about how other people had, who she claimed to have been at the McDonald's house had alibis for the night. So let's talk about Greg Mitchell, her boyfriend. Now, people in the McDonald camp often say that Greg Mitchell, again, who's Helena's boyfriend at the time, repeatedly confessed to the murders as well. Here's the problem. It just doesn't seem like this is true. The only evidence that Mitchell confessed is hearsay statements to others. So it's unlike with Stokely, where Stokely has said, you know, I had something to do with the murders. There is actually no formal confession by Mitchell. It's only hearsay statements. In fact, Mitchell took a polygraph and he passed. And for what that's worth, he repeatedly denied any involvement in the crimes. So if you have heard or you think that, you know, Greg Mitchell has also confessed to the murders, that's just patently not true. It's quite the opposite. No, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And you hear this all the time that Greg Mitchell, he confessed too, and that supports Stokely's confession. And I've just been able to, I have not been able to find any concrete evidence that Greg Mitchell ever sat down and confessed to anybody. I found some other people who said, there's one story that it's like a person who lived in the same town that Greg Mitchell was living in, who may or may not have been Greg Mitchell may or may not have confessed to two people that he committed a murder back when he was in North Carolina. But it's so vague, and it's not even clear that it's him. So how you can how you can hang this murder on Helena Stokely and Greg Mitchell on the basis of that, I don't know. Somebody else, we are always open to being corrected. If somebody out there has, has the Greg Mitchell confession, please send it to us. We will address it in some follow-up episode, but I just have not been able to find it. I haven't been able to find this definitive Greg Mitchell confession. I see it all the time. Articles say all the time that Helena Stokely confessed and so did her boyfriend, Greg Mitchell. But it's kind of like in the Scott Peterson thing where they keep saying that Russell Graybill, who is the postman, never testified when I've read the transcript in the trial where he's testifying. And it's like, this is just not true. And it's frustrating. And I feel like this is another example of that. 
Look, Greg Mitchell may have told some people he was involved with this. Greg Mitchell was just as messed up as Elena Stokely. He was on just as many drugs as she was. And Alice said it earlier. I don't understand false confessions. I don't get it. I don't know why people do it. In our last case, the Evansdale murders, which is the murders of two young girls, you know, two innocent young girls, unimaginable why anybody would do that. It's almost harder for me to understand why you would falsely confess to doing that. And yet in that case, there were two different false confessions. And you see that all the time. I don't know why they do it. In this case with Helena Stokely, it seems pretty clear that at various times, Helena believed she was involved, not necessarily because of any actual memory that she had, but because people kept telling her that she might be involved. I don't know if Greg Mitchell felt that way or not. Like I said, I haven't been able to find this concrete example of a confession by Greg Mitchell. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see if it exists, if how it compares with what Helena Stokely said. But we don't have it, and despite the continued assertions by the McDonald folks that it exists, we don't see it. Here's the thing. You got this this claim that that this cult was involved in this murder and you have Helena Stokely's story, you would think if there were that many people involved in this crime, there would be evidence of their presence in the McDonald residence that night. And some people have pointed to various pieces of evidence that they believe support this story. And let's go through a few of those. The first one, the candle wax. So McDonald's story is that when he was awoken by the hippies, he saw a woman standing in front of him holding a candle saying, acid is groovy, kill the pigs. This is consistent with what Helena Stokely later said, though whether she's saying it because McDonald said it first or because it actually happened is sort of the crux of this discussion. At McDonald's trial, his attorney put on evidence that three drippings of candle wax were found in the apartment, apparently attempting to show that the story McDonald was telling was legitimate. This is another thing. I feel like a lot of people, when they're discussing these cases, they always discuss things as if the jury never heard them. We saw that again and again in the Scott Peterson case, where people would say, here's this evidence, this concrete evidence, and then we would show, in fact, literally, at one point, concrete, that the jury did hear the evidence, weighed the evidence, and rejected it. Same thing with the candle wax. If you believe there was candle wax in the apartment, guess what? The jury heard about that candle wax. The defense put it on. But the prosecution had an opportunity to confront that evidence. And in this case, they countered with evidence that Colette was, in fact, a fan of candles and lit candles all the time. In fact, 14, 14 unused candles were found at the crime scene. The prosecution also introduced several glass bottles that contained multi-colored candle wax. As to the source of the three drippings, two weren't in the living room where you would expect them to be because that's where she's standing with the candle chanting acid is groovy, killed the pigs, but were in fact in Kimberly's room. The other, the only other unsourced wax dripping was in the dining room, which is not surprising because it appeared to be wax from birthday candles. And this wax was old. It was mixed with dust and other household debris. There was no trail of wax drippings leading from one room to another, as Alana Stokely's story would lead you to believe you would expect to find. And in fact, there were no drippings, none, in the living room where both Helena Stokely and Jeffrey McDonald said the woman with the floppy hat was holding the lit candle. And I know some of you said, well, maybe the wax didn't drip, but it's just not really conceivable, especially when they're trying to point to the the wax that was there and it can be really linked to um, candles that were already in the house. And now, okay, maybe that's not enough to convince you, but let's talk about the half-filled bloody syringe. Now, during the appeal process, McDonald lawyers claimed that a half-filled bloody syringe was found in a hallway closet. 
There's never been any evidence of its existence, and it appears that it originates from a statement that in a closet there were some syringes and blood. Two separate things. Now, this morphed into a half-filled bloody syringe. Now, every court that had, has ever considered this case has dismissed this factual claim because it was never shown to have any evidence that there was a half-filled bloody syringe. The thought of what this half-bloody syringe is, is that it was for drugs, right? That the hippies were using drugs and they left behind one of their half-filled bloody syringes. And that was somehow evidence pointing to the fact that the hippies were there. But every court that has considered it has dismissed that claim. From one court to consider this, they said, and I'll read you directly what the opinion says, the only evidence that a, quote, half-filled bloody syringe ever existed is contained in Medlin's somewhat ambiguous statement to Agent Toole. As Medlin's st affidavit indicates, when he made his statement to Agent Toole, he was only summarizing the information provided to him by other members of the crime scene processing team. He had no first-hand knowledge of the contents of the closet and denies ever seeing a half-filled syringe which bore blood stains. The implication of his statement and its second-hand nature is that Medlin misunderstood what the other investigators told him about the contents of the closet. In fact, this is what must have occurred for investigative agents having first-hand knowledge of the contents of the hall closet state or would state if called to testify at trial that no, quote, bloody half-filled syringe or other half-filled syringe was found in the closet. Moreover, the chemist who processed the hall closet for blood stains, Craig Chamberlain, and the agent who inventoried the medical supplies in the closet, Hagen Rossi, state without reservation that no half-filled syringe of any kind was found during the crime scene investigation. Measured against these statements by four witnesses having first-hand knowledge of the evidence gathered from the crime scene, McDonald's argument based as it is upon the statement of one witness summarizing information conveyed to him by others, that the government has suppressed evidence of a, quote, half-filled bloody syringe is simply not plausible. That's the end of the uh, quoted part of the opinion. By the way, this, this part of the opinion is exactly why we have hearsay rules in court. You can see how first-hand knowledge is incredibly important in this case because you can cross-examine someone, you can poke at what they're trying to tell you, and there is not any game of telephone. We all played the game of telephone when we were young. The fun of the game of telephone is you whisper some phrase to the person next to you, and that person hears it firsthand, then passes it on to the person next to them, and it goes around in a line or a circle, and the last person says what they've heard, everyone heard it firsthand, and everyone passed it on. And just about 100% of the time, the, the phrase that has traveled through the people will have morphed to the end, and it will not be what was originally stated. That is why we keep hearsay out. We want to be able to ask firsthand knowledge holders, what they saw, how they saw it, and to make sure there isn't any loss in translation as there appears to be here from, from Medlin. And that's how this supposed fact became something that is raised in every appeal, this half-filled bloody syringe. There was never a half-filled bloody syringe. That's exactly right. And you hear this all the time on the McDonald's side. They will tell you, they will shout to the rooftops, the jury never heard about the half-filled, half-filled bloody syringe. If only they had heard about that syringe, who knows what they might have decided. They might have decided that McDonald was innocent. Well, they shouldn't hear about the half-filled bloody syringe because there's no actual evidence that it exists. None at all. As Alice said, it's just a game of telephone. And even the guy who is responsible for this story says, I don't know anything about a half-filled bloody syringe i just that's what i think i heard from one of the technicians and the technicians are like well we didn't tell you that because we didn't find a half-filled bloody syringe and look this is one of those things that's so important and those of you out there 
we are all worried about false convictions. We're also we're all worried about wrongful convictions, and we want to make sure those don't happen. But when you hear people who have been convicted of crimes claiming various pieces of evidence that would exonerate them, you got to dig deep and you got to look and see. Does this make any sense? It's one of the reasons the Timogen Kinsu case stuck with us and we decided to do it because we looked into that case. Frankly, I kind of expected we'd look into it and we'd find a lot of evidence that we hadn't heard before that supported that he was guilty. We actually looked into it and no, that didn't exist. It wasn't there. And that's one of the reasons that case grabbed us. This is different. This is a case where people, whether it's the the wax or the syringe or some of the things we're going to talk about later or the confessions, McDonald says over and over and over again, as if saying it enough will make it true that this evidence exists. And yet, when you look at the actual record, it's just not there. Alice, before we continue, I want to welcome a new sponsor to the podcast, Care Of. Care Of has high quality products that meet personalization. All of Care Of's products are formulated with good for you, clean ingredients that are backed by science. Care Of is super transparent about the research and sourcing behind each one of their products. Your recommendations come in daily, individually wrapped packets that are perfect for getting back into or starting a routine. Here is an awesome feature of Care Of. They have a quick and reliable online quiz that is incredibly easy to take. And they ask you questions about your diet, your lifestyle, and any health concerns to help address your specific wellness goals. I took this online quiz. I was actually learning a lot about myself and had fun taking the quiz. Now, their holistic online quiz is like getting a one-on-one consultation with a nutritionist without leaving your house. And you get a personally tailored approach to your unique health needs, and you can retake the quiz at any time as your goals and needs changed. I uh, was able to get a bunch of recommended uh, supplements and vitamins that I didn't even think about, but made so much sense when I thought about my health goals. Now, follow care of expert recommendations or adjust your own pack at any time. What you get is totally up to you. They really offer maximum flexibility. So if you want to join us in Care Of, you can have 50% off your first Care Of order. Go to TakeCareOf.com and enter code TP50. That's for 50% off your first Care Of order. Go to TakeCareOf.com and enter code TP50. As we talked about, Alice mentioned that In that discussion by the court, the last thing the court says is that McDonald's argument, based as it is upon the statement of one witness summarizing information conveyed to him by others, that the government has suppressed evidence. That's really what this is all about. So McDonald's on appeal. Remember, this is not a trial. He's not trying to convince us that he's innocent necessarily. What he's trying to show is that there's some sort of fundamental unfairness in his trial that means he should get another bite at the apple. His trial should be vacated. He should be tried again. And this is actually an interesting thing and something I would also tell you to remember. Whenever you see a story about how someone's conviction has been overturned and how that means they're innocent, maybe they are, not saying they're not, But it's also possible that it's being overturned because of some impropriety by the government. Perfectly legitimate that it should be overturned, but that doesn't necessarily mean they didn't do it. McDonald here is trying to undermine his conviction so he'll get another shot. So he's saying, it's not that the half-filled bloody syringe proves I'm innocent. I don't have to do that. I don't have to prove I'm innocent. I just have to prove that the government had evidence that might lead a jury to believe that I was innocent, that it kept back. We've talked about Brady many times on this podcast, and this is what they are hitting at, Brady evidence. The government has evidence that potentially is exculpatory that leads you to believe it's possible that the defendant did not commit the crime. The government has to give that to the defense. The defense can use it however they want or not use it at all, but the government can't suppress it. So here... McDonald is essentially saying the government had that half-filled bloody syringe the whole time. They didn't tell us about it, and that's why we lost. 
but the court saying there's no evidence this syringe even exists, so how could they suppress it? You know, you lose on that count. It's not the only thing McDonald points to. The other thing he points to is Helena Stokely's bloody boots. You may recall we talked about how Helena Stokely gave her clothes to a friend and told them to get rid of them. McDonald has long claimed that the government had a pair of bloody boots belonging to Stokely that it never turned over to the defense. Obviously, this would be a big deal. The only problem for McDonald is much like the Hatfield bloody syringe, it's simply not true. It is true that CID did have some boots, but McDonald knew about them. And perhaps more importantly, they didn't actually belong to Stokely and they weren't bloody. The boots actually belonged to another woman who was involved in a separate stabbing. The police, not knowing if perhaps this was in fact the floppy hat woman that McDonald had talked about, seized those boots that she owned and turned them over to CID, even though they didn't actually match the description of the ones that McDonald claimed Stokely was wearing. These boots were analyzed. They were found to have no connection to the crime. There was no blood on them. There was nothing that matched them to McDonald's apartment. And they were eventually returned to the woman who owned them. And I will note again, these weren't Stokely's boots. Stokely is not the woman who they belong to. So McDonald's claim here is sort of doubly false. They didn't have blood on them and they weren't Stokely's boots. That will not stop you from hearing again and again and again from McDonald and his team that there was this pair of boots the government had that they never turned over. And this just shows you how you really have to look at the evidence and not just hear what's shouted in the media or what's shouted in news stories because they're just not the same standards. And it's essentially a publicity team on the McDonald's camp that just keeps stating facts that are not in fact facts, right? Bloody boots, half-filled syringes, half-filled bloody syringes. It's almost like there's a PR war rather than a an actual battle of the evidence. Now, there is also there those who want to argue that McDonald had an unfair trial also claim that Stokely was threatened and coerced by the prosecution at trial to recant her confession. This is based entirely on the testimony of former U.S. Marshal Jimmy Britt, who claimed to have been in the room when it happened. But Britt has been thoroughly discredited. Although Britt claimed to have bonded with Stokely while he transported her from Greenville, South Carolina to Raleigh, he actually lied about this. He drove her just five blocks from the county jail to the courthouse. This was revealed when documents recording the transport were revealed. Documents that Britt believed had been destroyed. So this is hugely terrible for Britt. He had this long involved story about how they had really bonded as a transport. And it's true. The U.S. Marshals transport witnesses or defendants, you know, anyone really in custody, they, they transport them for trials, federal trials. And so if someone is out of state, a U.S. Marshal will be with them. The problem is there are records of all of these things. As you can imagine, there could be claims of officer beatings of, you know, any sort of mistreatment. And so there's very strict records of who transports whom, where, and every step they take because it is in government vehicles, on government time. And here the records are clear. Britt only spent five blocks worth of time in the car with Stokely. Now, maybe she somehow poured out her heart in those five blocks. Very doubtful. Very doubtful because it sounds like someone wanted to insert himself into this national story and be some sort of a hero. And um, he thought he wasn't going to get caught, but he was. And this is also another example of how the facts and what happened can be twisted. The prosecution has always said they didn't do this. There was nothing like this happened in their discussion with Stokely about what her testimony was going to be contemporary statements by the prosecution seem to support that people who want to who want to believe McDonald will point to the fact that one of the prosecutors later was disbarred and lost his license 
he, I think he had entered into private practice and like so many lawyers, he got involved with some sort of fraud involving his client's funds and got, and got disbarred. I believe that's what happened. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know that there's ever been any allegation the prosecution was framing anybody that he was involved prosecuting. But in any event, here's what might have happened. I mean, you give Brit the benefit of the doubt and say some version of what he's saying is true. Remember, Helena Stokely is this person, this vulnerable person who is being pressured. I think pressured is not an incorrect term by the McDonald defense to get up on the stand and claim that she was involved in the murder of four people. It would not surprise me if someone on the prosecution team advised her of her rights when it came to that, that she did not have to confess to the murders of four people, and that if she were to do that, there might be consequences. And I just don't think that's improper, even if that's what happened. Yeah, I I agree. It certainly sounds like twisting of completely proper procedure. As I said earlier, you would think that if McDonald were right, and there were several people, at least four people, maybe five, maybe six, depending on on the how you think this story was going down, were in his home, there would be some physical evidence of their presence. I mean, one thing you definitely don't see, you don't see, remember it was raining. It was a, it was a stormy night. It was raining. There's no muddy footprints. There's no leaves. There's nothing like that. No wet footprints. This is weird considering the fact that McDonald said at some point that Helena Stokely's boots were muddy. You would expect to see footprints. Some people have said, well, CID didn't leave any footprints either. So that's proof that the murderers didn't leave footprints. I don't know that CID did the best job of investigating this crime, but they are trained not to contaminate a site. So it's not that surprising to me that they didn't leave muddy footprints all over the place. It would be more surprising to me that a group of drugged out hippies did not leave any, any evidence of their presence. But some people say there is something, a piece of physical evidence that ties the hippies to McDonald's apartment. And that is a hair, a long hair from a wig that was located in the house. Three fibers, 24, 22, and 9 inches long, were found on a hairbrush in the dining room next to Colette's purse. The theory is that Stokely brushed her wig and the hair came out. The problem with this is that every expert consulted has said that wigs don't use the type of fiber that was found there, a saran fiber. Dolls, on the other hand, do. And the hair used in dolls is often doubled over when implanted, accounting for the length of the longest hairs. And we know that the McDonald girls owned several dozen dolls. The FBI, and this is something interesting that I didn't know until this case, actually keeps a whole bunch of wigs and dolls in their evidence room for just this sort of comparison. So when they get a hair like this, they can compare it and tell you, does it come from a wig or does it come from a doll? Brett, I don't want to stumble into that room by accident. (laughs) That sounds terrifying. That'd be freaky. Yeah, the wigs on the one side and the dolls on the other. (laughs) That sounds terrifying. Uh, But they've got it. And you know what they did? They compared these three hairs to the hairs in their collection. And in fact, they were able to match the fibers to the hair of some of the dolls that they keep. But the hair matched none of the fibers from their wigs. And no one has ever been able to find an example of wigs from that era that use saran fibers. The only example that's ever been found is like an antique wig from a hundred and something years ago that may have used saran fibers. Obviously not the kind of wig you would expect Helena Stokely to have been wearing. So basically, even though this section is is titled Evidence Against the Hippies, I think what we have is a lot of noise about supposed evidence against hippies, but in fact, all of it's been debunked, and there none of this actually is evidence that Stokely or any other hippies were there at the crime scene. 
Right. When it comes down to it, and you're talking about the hippies, all you have is a story. Now, it's a great story. And it's a story that, that always makes you think. And you always think about that woman in the floppy hat standing on the corner when the MP drives by with the rain pouring down on her. And you think, man, maybe McDonald wasn't lying. But when it comes to the physical evidence, I don't know of anything, anything concrete that McDonald's ever been able to point to to substantiate the presence of so many people in his room that night. And then when you think about the story that Helena Stokely tells and the story that McDonald tells and how those stories don't match up, even with Helena Stokely having the benefit of McDonald's story, and even though clearly her story incorporates aspects of that story, either because it actually happened or because she heard it from McDonald, the vast majority of it just doesn't line up. And the interesting thing about this case, this is not like Scott Peterson or Michael Peterson, where there are multiple different things that could happen. I mean, take Michael Peterson. It's possible that his wife fell down the stairs. It's possible that Michael Peterson attacked her. It's even possible there was an intruder, even though, much like this case, there's no evidence of an intruder. It's possible that an owl attacked her, as we've talked about before. There are multiple different things that could have happened. But in this case, there are only two choices. Either, either this group of hippies attacked and killed this family, or Jeffrey McDonald was responsible for their murders. There is no third option. It's one of the two. We've talked about today the evidence against the hippies. Next time, we're going to turn to the evidence against McDonald. And we're going to see, is there any evidence that McDonald was involved in this? And if there is, how does it weigh against the other story that we've been told? The story that Jeffrey McDonald and to some extent Helena Stokely has told us. That's what we're going to do next time. We're going to dive into that and really and really talk about the story that the evidence tells us and see if at the conclusion of that we can reach some sort of consensus on what happened that night all the way back in 1970. I'm sure you already have thoughts. We've, we've given you a lot of homework, so if any of you guys can answer any of those questions, I hope you'll reach out to us. Our email address is prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod for all your social media, Reddit and YouTube. You can also check us out on Patreon, or if you want to support the podcast, you can go to the our store and buy any number of items from there. Remember, all the proceeds from that go to support the Cold Case Research Institute so you can do so without feeling guilty. You guys check out Hannah Hill on Instagram, who provided the artwork for this episode and all our episodes. Her username is at Sirius Moonlight. We love her. She's amazing. And... Keep on giving us your suggestions about cases we should cover. We love all your feedback. Well, Alice, do you have anything else you want to add before we sign off for tonight? The kind of manipulation and megaphoning of evidence that is not in fact evidence is actually just very infuriating as a practitioner because this is what we fight against all day in court. And it is frustrating that people can rely on stories that are told by the defense or the prosecution of things that they could never get into court, that they tried repeatedly and are shot down by every single court that they try, but that there are real people out there who may not know how to read trial transcripts, who may not know or want to, <laughs> for that matter, sit through a trial or watch a trial and to sift out what the actual evidence is. And in a lot of cases, we hear these sorts of the this ev the supposed evidence repeated to us constantly. Oh, the evidence you're telling us sounds so good, but geez, that wig hair, no wig hair, that syringe, no half filled bloody syringe. It really, you know, it, it really offends me because I think it's misleading to the people that you have a duty to the public when you kind of perpetuate these, not even half truths, just really bald-faced lies. And so that's, you know, what we try to do here is to really tease out the evidence. We have no, we have absolutely no um, aim or conclusion we're trying to reach here. We're trying to follow where the evidence leads us. And so far, there just simply isn't any evidence of the, that kind of hippie story so far. But 
is there evidence against McDonald's? You know, we'll see next time when you come when you come back. Yeah, and we'll we'll have a lot more to say about that. I just want to note there are actually innocent people in prison right now. And Scott Peterson, he got a six part miniseries on FX and Mr. McDonald, Dr. McDonald got a I think a five part miniseries on Hulu. I kind of wish some of those uh some of those resources might have been dedicated to some other people, but Next time, we will take a look at the evidence against Dr. McDonald and we'll let you decide for yourself what you think, what the story is that the evidence tells. Is it the, is it the story that McDonald wants you to believe, or is it something a little, maybe a little less exciting, a little less dramatic, and a little less scandalous, but nevertheless tragic? Well, we will be back next time to discuss all that, but until then... I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. Just just be like, hey, new phone, who this? ever said that in jest i've never ever said it in real life i like you alice you're my favorite yeah my favorite it. podcast host um oh, am i not your only i mean i've been mainlining a little bit you know i did uh, <laughs> the horror that's right i will never be a horror i'm sorry i don't know enough about horror we're like well miss alice alice is not on there i was like alice doesn't know anything about horror at all <laughs> at all she can make it up Not even a little bit. I don't even know where to start. think if anything interesting happened today i don't think it did um yesterday was our one year i know that's so exciting isn't that exciting can you believe that i can't can you believe we've been doing this for a year i can't either i can't believe we're doing this period 